be posted to the Q&A box um, and we will get to them uh, as, as we can. Um, any questions that are not addressed um, will be collected and provided to the participants for follow-up. Um, and so with that, I would like to turn it over to um, the moderators, uh, John Michael Sauer and Vijay Jajnik. Um, thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Chandler, and, and welcome everybody. I'm uh, really looking forward to today's uh, panel discussions. I mean, as you know, the webinar actually started the day that you registered and had then access to the, um, the, the recorded videos. Those videos will be up for a while, and so if you weren't able to get through them all, that's okay. Um, you can go ahead and, and look at them as your leisure over, at your leisure over the next few weeks. Next slide, please, Chandler. So what our goal today is to really talk about, you know, what, what biomarkers are available for IBD and how we then work those through the uh, FDA, FDA, US FDA and uh, EMA uh, regulatory acceptance process. You know, really what, it, what our hope is, is with this webinar, is, is to really facilitate partnerships so that we can figure out how to push these biomarkers through to regulatory acceptance and ultimate use in, in drug development. Next slide, please. As, as I spoke to before, we have a number of uh, pre-recorded videos um, that really go into depth around uh, quite a few pertinent issues. You know, one issue is around the patient's perspective and what's really needed from a uh, therapy and from a biomarker perspective. Um, uh, what I was able to do is I was able to present on some activities that we've done previously around a landscape analysis for, for Crohn's disease and associated biomarkers. We also have an overview of um, um, 3TR. It's an, I, an innovative medicines initiative, an IMI initiative in, in, in Europe. And CPATH has partnered you know, very closely with this group to, to, to create this, this webinar and, and discussion series. We also then go into IMI itself, um, and then there are a series of case studies around um, exploratory biomarkers and biomarkers progressing to that regulatory ready status to where they, they, they can be applied within drug development. We've also had the opportunity to have a, a, a health authorities perspective on biomarkers. Um, and as you saw, we're gonna have two panel sessions today. The first panel session is really gonna concentrate on the biomarkers themselves. Well, the second panel session will go ahead and, and concentrate on some of the, the regulatory perspectives of, of pulling biomarkers through to use in drug development. Next slide, please, Chandler. So a couple thoughts before we get started. I, I, every time that, that we have a biomarker discussion, um, regardless of the, the therapeutic area or the disease, we always begin to talk about drug development tools, right? Biomarkers to be used in that drug development clinical trial space, but that also begins to matriculate into to the clinical practice space. So I, I think we need to be clear when we're talking today what we're actually talking about. And we're primarily gonna concentrate on that drug development tool space, right? But we can, you know, we, we have to recognize that many of these biomarkers can also be used in the clinical practice space. The expectations for both of those spaces are different, right? And we can talk a little bit about that in, in some of our panel sessions, um, but, but I just wanted to point that out. I also wanna point out that there are incredible opportunities right now within the IBD space for bringing biomarkers forward. We actually have very few biomarkers that, that, that are used for re regulatory decision-making. And I think we have the opportunity, as some of the speakers spoke to, to go ahead and pull some of these biomarkers forward. I think we also have to acknowledge the fact that there are, you know, regulatory endorsement processes by EMA, PMDA, and, and US FDA. And, and we're going to talk about some of those also in the second panel session. So there is a pathway to pull these biomarkers forward for regulatory decision making. And, 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 and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to uh, clarify any questions around that. Um, next slide, please. You might ask why CPATH is interested in this. Well, you know, for the past 15 years, you know, we've been bringing forward um, 
solutions and uh, regulatory uh, uh, drug development tools um, to go ahead and open up opportunities for drug developers to more rapidly bring um, their innovations uh, to uh, patients. And, and that's exactly what we're interested in doing here, right? Is working with uh, different groups to go ahead and be able to pull biomarkers forward for qualification and use uh, for drug development. Next slide, Chandler. The nice part is we've been really successful at this over the past 15 years, and we have many accomplishments that we can show. And what we want to do is share the know-how that we've um, developed within this space and work with individuals to go ahead and, and, and bring forward qualified biomarkers. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Vijay to not only talk a little bit about 3TR, but to then also uh, work his way into the first panel session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Don Michael. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our project 3TR. Um, so my name is Vijay Ajnik. I work for Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Uh, I am the clinical portfolio lead for microbiome, and I'm very excited to, you know, to do some studies in Crohn's disease, particularly. I know trying to understand proteobacteria. Also, we also have some live bacterial consortium. As a part of that public-private partnership role I, I do for Takeda, I was able to uh, lead this program called 3TR, Taxonomy, Treatment, Targets, and Remission. Um, this is a multi, uh, you know, multi-investigator, multi-pharma, uh, and the monies come from the European Union. As you see, it's an 80 million euro, 84 month, uh, 69 partners in 15 countries. It's quoted by Marta Alarcon Riquelme. She's at the a center in, 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 in Spain and, and, and from the industry side, the projects that through Terry Means of Sanofi. May I have the next slide? So what we're trying to do here is we're looking at seven disease areas. So it's uh, COPD, um, asthma, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, multiple sclerosis, SLE, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. And trying to see if we could just come together in parallel and try to understand, you know, using integrations of, you know, multiomics and to understand really can we actually come up with some novel biomarkers and really try to understand treatment non response. Um, and that's sort of the objective. And in IBD, we have both Crohn's and also colitis. That program is led by Stefan Treiber and myself. Um, and what we also the overall microbiome lead across all these disease areas. Uh, Stefan's not here, but hopefully he'll join any minute and we can have more introductions on that. So, uh, may I have the next slide? So, what I would like to do for the next few minutes um, is to first ask each of you to introduce yourself. And Ashwin, I'll start with you. I'm going to use you, all of you, by your first name, so apologize for that. But I think just to keep it a little more informal to just use our first name basis. I would request you to actually give me an, some information on your video because, uh, you know, recognizing people are busy, they may not have seen that. So if you give me a synopsis of your video, of what you do, and then we can go around the room. I think I have Stefan texting me, so let me just go. It says passwords do not work. Okay. Um, Ashwin, do you want to go ahead? Sure. So I'm Ashwin Anantakrishnan. I am a gastroenterologist working at the Crohn's and Colitis Center at Mass General Hospital. My area of research focuses on trying to develop tools that help personalize therapy for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I think as you will see through multiple different talks, it is really important endeavor. Trying to refine how to better use our existing treatments and use that knowledge to develop new treatments, I think are critically important for the field. My focus for the past few years has been in trying to understand how that question is answered by the microbiome and some of the other related platforms as well. And so we have over the past few years set up sort of rigorous prospective cohorts where we're following patients systematically with profiling their clinical data and, and their microbial profile using metagenomic sequencing. And we were able to show that using a snapshot of microbial composition that you are able to start understanding who is likely to respond or not respond to, to specific therapies. And in my webinar, in addition to describing our study that did that and, and work that we're continuing to do, I also highlight 
some of the other important groups work that have looked at the role of microbiome in projecting trajectory of disease, which I think is also a very important clinical course using parameters that are obtained at diagnosis to look ahead five years after, after diagnosis. And so I think there is very intriguing data. There are limitations with using microbiome as a biomarker that I'm sure we'll get to in the panel as well, but mechanistically given the central role of the microbiome in virtually all of those diseases that you highlighted a couple of slide, slides ago, I think it is, you know, microbiome is one of the most promising tools to, to achieve the missions that, that you outlined. So I look forward to engaging with the panel about that. Thank you, Ashwin. Um, Fred, do you wanna go next? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Fred Berrybaud. I'm at uh, Johnson & Johnson. And I, the presentation we made was about a signature based on transcriptomics in UC, which aims at identifying a patient population which is particularly hard to treat. It seems to be refractory to previous treatment, repeated previous treatments, um, and therefore both represents a unique unmet need um, but also represents a population which, at least if we push our thinking, uh, would question how we should address their unmet need. And, and we don't believe that the current ways of approaching their treatment needs uh, is satisfactory to, to them. Um, so, you know, how in this conversation we're having today, how would you use that tool? Does, does the usage we pitched in our video, does it, does it make sense? And, and how, how do we go about using it? Thank you. And Fred, may I add that you're also the co-lead with uh, uh, Terry and the entire 3TR project. So you have a ton on your plate. So thank you for that. Uh, I think is uh, Bing in here or am I is he still uh, trying to dial in? All right, so Brian, why don't we go with you? Thanks. Um, I'm Brian Lingi. I'm a clinical translational scientist at um, Alimentive. And so Alimentive is a CRO working with sponsors in the gastrointestinal field to develop clinical trials and um, execute clinical trials. And a big part of that is, is not only looking at endpoints and how to optimally develop endpoints, but also biomarkers for the, um, you know, the, the development of efficient trials and, you know, effective trials. So um, the presentation I put on today was focusing on transcriptomics. So that's, of course, a, a global level analysis of gene transcription. And I think from a, if I can make a pitch for transcriptomics, it offers a kind of a, a unbiased and a global view of, of potential candidate biomarkers, which, um, depending on the platform, can be a pretty generalized process, so microarray or RNA-seq, um, so pretty reproducible from that point of view. And so we are really able to look at uh, upwards of tens of thousands of different potential candidate biomarkers. So the question we tried to tackle was using different uh, biomarker um, uh, data sets, so of eight, the eight different data sets we can find publicly, do they agree on giving the same answer to the question of, you know, is this or that gene a a potential biomarker for, for disease activity or, or, you know, disease versus normal in this case. And so as a kind of a, a proof of principle, we did a meta-analysis of these data sets and found um, similarities and differences using a random effects model. And so this allowed us to summarize the different data sets in a single, single kind of uh, summary statistic, but also showed us that there are differences between these data sets um, that may be even due to either patient population, because these are done at different clinical sites, or it could be also systematic due to experimental differences. So, um, like I said, as a proof of principle, this really provides us an idea of, of how to apply these meta-analysis so that you can get the, the sum of the data from, from, different, um, from, from different data sets as well, um, and highlight some, some potential uses of these as biomarkers uh, for different studies. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. I know Stefan is around. He's not able to hear us. I was hoping uh, the CPATH team and the organizers, can you please to get his audio fixed? He's not having either. Um, I, he's calling. Uh, Stefan, can you introduce yourself?
Yeah, we're on. Yes, where the panel is uh, waiting for your introduction. It'd be great if you introduce yourself on your role in 3TR. Yeah, I'm a subscriber. Okay, I'm not in the media. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're in the middle of the meeting. Deepak, could you guys help Stefan or I could send you his number? Or what could we do, uh, John Michael? And so um, Kitty has uh, reached out to Stefan. I believe that she sent him a new link. He could now link into the meeting, hopefully, and then join us. That's correct. Try it, and then okay, as soon as you come, we'll introduce you. We're going to get moving here because everybody's online. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. No, no, that's all right. I'm sorry about that. Hey, it's it's always tough with these uh, with these virtual meetings. Things happen like this, so work our way through it. Yeah. So who's ever typing? Can you go on mute, please? Yeah, thank you. All right. So let's get started. So I think it was very powerful. I know Bing is not here, but he, you know, um, uh, oh, Parimbi, I forgot you. Sorry, Parimbi, you need to introduce yourself. I really apologize. No, no problem. <laughs> But no problem at all. I'm so distracted I'm, with Stefan's uh, arrival. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I'm Parambir. I'm at the University of California, San Diego. Um, my research largely focuses on um, real world pragmatic studies, both observational and clinical trials. And so the talk that I put together was around the US IBD Health Outcomes Consortium, where we've sort of brought together academic centers across the US to not only study drugs and predictors of response in practice, but also begin to evolve towards studying uh, transcriptomics and metaomic microbial sequencing as ways to um, look at novel interventions and do early phase two, phase three studies in a pragmatic fashion. Thank you, Parambir. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry, I'm still a little distracted. We're trying to see, get stuff on if you can get in there. Um, so, guys, so let me stay. We start with, you know, Bing is not here, but, you know, he gave this really powerful video about, you know, what the unmet needs of the patients with the young other yeah, patients. Bing, yeah. Bing is on the line. Oh, good. Bing, can you introduce yourself, please? I don't see you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Hi, I'm I'm sorry. I I've had some technical difficulty. I should know no, no, better no. by now after a year of this. Um, uh, my name is Bing Hinton. I um, uh, a, a researcher by training and work in the nonprofit world now on healthcare processes. But I'm here as a uh, patient stakeholder, and um, my narrative was an attempt to try to pull out specific experiences over 30 years when things look very differently and um, identify situations that would have benefited significantly from um, biomarkers and a lot of the uh, complex issues that, that this group is addressing. And hello, my name is Stefan Schreiber. Do you hear me? Yes, you made it, Stefan. Thank you. Yeah, do you hear me, Stefan Schreiber here? We can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Um, I'm happy that I'm a good company with technical issues. I <laughs> also needed until now to uh, get myself into this. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist from Kiel, Germany, and I have done the last uh, 15 or 20 years um, a biomarker work, either uh, addressing the etiology of chronic inflammatory diseases with a broader scope than IBD or IBD therapeutic responses. And we published a little bit on that. Thank you, Stefan. All right, so let's get straight into the questions. A couple of things as an organizer we don't have, and I would like you to put those two things. We have not had a session on antimicrobial antibodies. And the other thing we have not done much of is imaging as a biomarker. So I think uh, uh, when, we, when we chat, I'd like you to include those two aspects as well. So Parambi, I'm gonna go straight to you first, right? You know, you've done this incredible study that you just proposed and, you know, and we've looked at data sets that were validated like albumin across all these uh, different uh, uh, studies elsewhere. How do you think, what are the next steps for you to take that sort of real world evidence to make it, you know, I know we said we talk much about clinical biomarkers, but to make that as an impact for somebody like Bing was asking, like he wants to go to the, the doctor's office, say you want to know which drug to use and how it'll work for you. So could you start there? 
Yeah, so I mean, I think it gets towards the concept of, of how do we transform into personalized medicine with some of the tools. Um, and I, I think um, when it comes to biomarkers, you can think of decision support tools as a biomarker in some capacity, whether they have lab values or actual serum stool based biomarkers. And, and I think point of care decision making tools are probably going to be the way to go. And we've actually transformed a lot of those tools that I showed in the video into online uh, tools that the providers can use in clinic to actually guide patient care and patient discussions about treatment options. But where I think we're really heading is to leverage some of those early tools to then begin to collect, um, you know, different samples like serum and stool and begin to look for other novel biomarkers that can be added on um, to run some of these. I know, uh, you know, when I was at Dartmouth as a resident, I had a chance to work with Corey and some of his um, prospect tool work around using genetics and serolo serology to pr predict Crohn's disease courses. Um, and the transformation of that into a shared decision making tool is, I think, very powerful um, and probably where the future really is with the integration of the two for patient care. Thank you. So when you think of real world evidence and, you know, Ashwin, I'm going to ask you to answer this is like uh, real world evidence. You try to consent to patients. You know, I think when we consent patients, even the EMA sometimes ask, you know, what is their benefit when you do a clinical trials? How do you, are there challenges there? Are patients willing to do this? And how do, how do we address that? I mean, I think, yes, every patient wants to know before they start a drug, right? Is it going to work for them or not? So this is something they can relate to very easily. And it is something that they see helping them in the not too distant future. Unfortunately, none of the drugs we have now are permanent solutions. So even if they are embarking on a study now to look and see if they're going to respond to ENF, the information they get may well inform their next therapy choice three years down the road, five years down the road. And these are, you know, very practical possibilities in how quickly some of these biomarkers can be integrated into clinical care. And so I think once you highlight that to the patient that it's not an abstract benefiting the field, but, you know, very real benefiting them in the future, I think patients are willing to, to sign on. The challenge has been in how, and with all these tools, it's a balance between how dense you want the sampling to be, like what the scientist wants, right? You want a stool sample every day, every week, a blood sample every week. That's not something that is going to be realistic. And so that's where I think these partnerships are helpful to, to arrive at a balance where, you know, where you, you get enough data that is meaningful, but at the same time, it's not burdensome. Yeah, thank you. So Stefan, what, what about your opinion? I mean, you're on the other side of the pond. Do you think there are some inter-country rules? Is it easy to collaborate with these current rules and uh, patient consents? Are there any? I think there, there are a number of issues in here. Uh, there's a developmental issue. This is a developmental paradigm for biomarker. I think, um, Unfortunately, this is um, so much, um, I think, um, I would say commercially driven that many biomarkers are not um, going into the light of the day because they may be not commercializable in the extent as some of the um, providers dream of this. I think this is a big problem that needs to be addressed and only can be addressed for public money because that's the only way how we see a life being given to these biomarkers. And the second problem is indeed that in a doctor's office, you do not have a cohort sitting, but just a single patient. So that means your requirement for an odds ratio and for immediacy of the biomarker in use is much higher than if you drive cohorts where, you know, even small effects with high statistical power are meaningful. Here it's an individual decision making. Most likely a biomarker plays a role when it comes to side effects because there the decision making is most immediate. If you look at efficacy, you know, the um, requirements are high for biomarker to be used. And then the third point is that I think that um, the idea of a point of care systems and others, at least in Europe, do not fly well because I would not be prepared to take responsibility for any point of care device. So um, um, uh, I want this responsibility to sit with the laboratories and not with me. There's a lot of regulatory background when it comes to point of care devices. And I want to see my life being burdened with this. 
And that brings you to the last point, which is the utility of a biomarker. Let me say what the ideal biomarker is. The ideal biomarker is indeed a body fluid, maybe a stool sample, which I can dry down, which I can put into a male, which, you know, stays stable within a week or so and can be sent to some kind of assessment place. If that will be the case, then I think it takes a lot of my problems away. If I talk about volatile biomarkers, immediate assessments, things like that, things already become complicated. And finally, I can only agree with Parambir when he says, you know, the simple physician at the end of the game is not as structured as some of us are thinking about literature, whatever. He wants basically um, a traffic light, yellow, green, and red, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. No, I think uh, those are really excellent points. So, um, one of the things, you know, when you hear, you know, Brian did this meta-analysis and gene expression signature, we're going to go to the extreme end. So we start with albumin, which is sort of a, for lack of a better word, a low-hanging fruit. And then we go into these gene expression signatures. What I was troubled by the video was that uh, despite all the stuff, he said, you know, patient metadata was not available. And, and I know Ashwin and Bermier are mathematically inclined guys. Can't you come up with a single clinical research form across the country, across the globe, where it should be just simply automatic with all the tools we have? Why was there no single alignment to that? Um, did any of you want to take that question? I can, I can comment on that because this was a big hurdle when we when we put together the IBD consortium. I mean, one of the first steps we had to take was uniformity in data collection across the institutions for the patient metadata. Um, and, you know, once you get into it, what you realize is there's wide practice variability in how we take care of these patients, how we monitor them, and how we document how well they're doing. Um, and I think that leads to a lot of the variability in the patient metadata across some of these studies. Um, you know, there have been attempts at integrating uniform data collection approaches across EMRs, data templates for these patients, um, but it's all at the end of the day, you know, related to provider uptake. Um, and so I, I think there's definitely opportunities and we've been successful in the consortium and being able to get some uniformity. But it really requires, you know, championing it with all of the individual sites, getting them to buy in, getting them to feel like it's worth the effort um, to go that extra step to collect some additional information that's not maybe immediately, you know, recognizable as valuable. But at the end of the day, you need a lot of patient metadata to be able to explore novel insights and identify novel sort of discoveries. So do you think this is a gap that could we just have like word recognition or some other software that goes into and does a de-identified form. And if that was there for everybody, I think it would make simple. I mean, anybody else want to take that? Brian, is your team looking at the He has made a big statement, which is very true. And that is that you need to prospectively define what you're gathering. The idea is that you de-identify patients and take the remaining data, which has been generated for other purposes, very often does not work. So I feel if you want to collect that and do a biomarker, discover a biomarker, I think indeed you have to get prospective data collection ongoing. I agree with you that then the export, the identification zone is important, but you have to give some structure to healthcare. If you think this just falls out and you do SNOMED, data mining, whatever, and then you have your information that hasn't worked in the past. Yeah, and I think yeah. within the context of clinical trials, you know, as a prospective studies, then you can start to define some of these and that's even a, a hurdle in itself. But then when you get in the real world setting um, with hospitals, it becomes even more complicated. And then I guess the, the last point I would say is that often you don't know what variables are gonna be important. And, you know, ideally you would dump all the data you have in a, you know, a readily harmonized form, um, as you said, VJ, and, and that would be, um, th that would be optimal. Um, what I think I found in my study was, um, you know, on these public databases, people put the minimal amount of data to kind of fulfill the requirement um, and with, with some exceptions where there were people who are providing a lot more of that data. But generally, I think the motivation is not to provide every piece of data, but more to fill the, the minimal requirement. So as we can start to think of these more as, you know, publicly um, useful data sets, um, th then we maybe can get there, hopefully in the future. 
Yeah, I think you have also left one important aspect out, and that's the purpose for which the data is generated. Let's take something very simple. You know, when the um, uh, billing changed in Germany to DRGs, which are diagnostic related groups and flat fee billing was introduced instead of itemized billing as we had before, suddenly no longer uh, urinary tract infections were out there. Everybody had a urosepsis because it was paid higher. And I think the medical documentation, including all the ICD-10 codes is transformed also to the fact that's primarily used for billing for billing and for medical legal purposes. So if you really want to collect data for, for, for biomarker discovery, I think you have to open another window for that kind of documentation. And it doesn't have to be as stringent as a clinical trial. It can be much, much easier, much more lenient. So, so I think, uh, I mean, think you want to say something before I should, but let me just ask a patient voice here and then I'll give it to you a second. I think you want to say, do you, what, it's your data, what do you think? Bing, I think you're on mute. I can't hear you. Hi, Vijay. I'm sorry. I, I just got back on. I was uh, yeah. kicked off and rebooted. Oh, no. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, okay. So maybe, Ashwin, you go because maybe uh, Bing is a, uh, but yeah, just finish your thought. And I, I, I think we'll like, we'll park this as a major gap. And, uh, but go ahead, finish, Ashwin, your thought. No, I think you have to you have to balance between the size and the depth, right? You cannot both have an extremely large cohort with extremely yeah. detailed data, right? Then, 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 if you have infinite resources, then anything is possible, right? But unfortunately, resources are finite everywhere, so you have to sort of compromise between one and the other. And I think for biomarker discovery, I think depth and accuracy is critically important. But for validation, I think there can be a little more gray. And that's where I think de-identified data and applying NLP and other sort of bioinformatic tools are actually very valuable. I mean, we were able to show that for our genetics um, TNF response study, for example, where, you know, over a summer, there was a student rigorously going through 300 charts to classify response and non-response and, and picking up genes that predict that. But then we were then able to apply it to an independent sort of EHR linked cohort where we used these de-identified NLP tools to classify response and non-response, and we were able to show that the initial genes validate in in the de-identified data set with you know far less effort. So I think we just have to be smart about which data source to use for which purpose. So okay, that's great. So do you think if this is a true gap, could we not stimulate some programming pro programmers to look at? word finding and then rebuild a kind of a totally de-identified data set rather the data sets not for being and what have you but let's just finish this i mean unless somebody wants the last point but i think maybe the cr i think this is a major gap um i think brian after listening to all your hard work and that video i felt like this is crazy we don't know that if the metadata is not linked properly that was quite a bit of a challenge so any other final thoughts we're going to move on to the next point um so let's go to the extreme end. So we talked about, again, the gene signature. So Fred, what would be your vision for a perfect biomarker? Huh, tough question, VJ. <laughs> um, I, I think so. For, from, a, from a drug development viewpoint, um, the perfect biomarker would uh, allow us to better anchor the clinical responses we're trying to measure. Um, that would certainly be a priority. The, unfortunately, some of the clinical endpoints we use are um, carry some imprecisions, especially in the middle of the scales they're using, which uh, don't allow us to quickly assess whether a drug is beneficial to the patients or not. And, and it seems like a waste of patient engagement, resources from our part to pull them through um, lengthy trials without being able to, to assess the response accurately. So, so the ideal biomarker would allow us to do a very small, quick trial and then project response, long-term response, um, so that we can either proceed or, or move on to the next therapeutic. That would be the ideal solution. And 
And then whether it's based on any of the omics dimensions we discuss uh, wouldn't matter, right? And whether it's yeah. peripheral tissue or, or disease tissue would also not matter. Yeah. And I think maybe an important point here, and I think that's, you made it some, some excellent um, points there, Fred, is, is when we talk about biomarkers, and, and I know that CPATH is, is pushed this forward, is, is, you know, in their terminology, context of use. Like, what is the purpose of a biomarker? They're not all for the same the same purpose, whether they be, you know, predicting response at, ba you know, a baseline, can, will this drug work in this patient? Can we predict that? Versus a pharmacodynamic marker, which you're looking for correlation with dose and find, helping in drug development to identify the optimal dose or whether you're looking for a safety biomarker. So I think, you know, maybe that's one thing that I think is, is maybe help the conversation is what is the ideal biomarker is, is often dependent on what you want to what you want to do scientifically or from a medical point of view? I think the ideal biomarker um, would be a, a biomarker that has a high odds ratio for a therapeutic decision and which is present uh, long before a start therapy. So classifying ex ante uh, patients into A to Z. Um, I think that is often not achievable. I don't see any biomarker that comes even close to this. So then the next best biomarker where a biomarker can take under therapy and that allows me early decision making. So where I have two weeks or four weeks of therapy going on, and I can talk to a patient on chronic disease, whether he goes on or not. And that is different from oncology. In oncology, you can't use such biomarker because oncology, you just need the ex-ante marker, but the ex-post marker in the chronic disease would be equally valuable. It would be like a success parameter you do after you have introduced your therapy. And the likelihood in a complex disease of different etiologies that you find a biomarker in response to a therapeutic intervention is also higher than to have an ex-under biomarker classifying patients. But in those cases, you know, what's characterized by how it's ratio. Right, so I think one of the things we can just make it clear to the people, the audience, and um, that we're not changing the diagnosis of Crohn's disease of ulcerative colitis, right? So we need that endoscopy, colonoscopy, biopsy, on histology, all pathologists can tell you whether this is an acute injury, chronic injury, it's not an infection, it's IBD, there's cryptapsis, there's basal cell plasmacytosis, and all kinds of different things. And he said diagnosis is separate. And I think the intervention then becomes is, you know, if somebody is in, say, you know, Parambir's office and asking the question, what is the next best drug for me? So I think we I think all of us feel like they're having that prognostic biomarker in the clinic matters. And then for the drug developer, it's uh, basically, you know, which is that particular subject that I should intervene to see that is a therapeutic response, as you spread to say. So Fred, we go back to your, um, the gene expression, it took, almost took over 10 years if you saw the first paper in 2009, and then 2019, and now you're almost but 10, to, 10 to 12 years of hard work. And you've come up with a biomarker with high negative predictive value. Right, so that's something that was in the video from Deanne that, that was quite powerful. So I like to think what the audience thinks on this. Um, is, so for Ashwin in your clinic, is a negative predictive value more valuable or positive predictive value? What are, what should be what should be the clinical versus research marker? What's most valuable? I mean, I think both are valuable, but I do want to, you know, emphasize what is clinically most useful is something that helps separate out treatments. Like not like knowing somebody is unlikely to respond to a TNF doesn't help me much if that same marker is common across all drugs. Right then, I might as well try try any of them. It doesn't separate out. So to me, this that is one of the sort of biggest challenges and limitations in the biomarker field. It's sort of and understandably these silos across drugs and in and individual sort of therapeutic mechanisms that I think are clinically useful, but not not much. You really need across drug collaborations to try to separate out which of these choices is the best. And then okay. positive or negative doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, Stefan, what do you want to say here? What the Yeah, also, uh, I said said before basically let's let me join in later. I have not much to add here. Okay, Barbie, anything you want to add here? Yeah, I mean, I yeah. think um, I agree with Ashwin's point. I, I mean, I think an, a, for me, an ideal biomarker is 
something that can differentiate um, response um, if you're going to use it at baseline. But when we think about biomarkers that are measuring responsiveness of the underlying disease process to an intervention, um, you know, you want something that's readily measurable, um, you know, consistent in measurement across patients, so low interpatient variability due to just normal heterogeneity, um, and is responsive to changes in underlying biological processes. And I mean, I think a great example that we can potentially learn from is the um, MRI story with um, fatty liver disease and fibrosis, yep. and MRI PDFF and some of the the work they've done to show the incremental value of MRI over liver biopsy because it sort of overcomes that intersegment variability in fibrosis, the responsiveness to change, its use in early drug development to identify responsive therapies that are prognostic of future outcomes. And you know, you you we haven't touched on imaging here, um, but they you know wonder if imaging is another opportunity um, for drug development purposes. Um, if we can get the right, you know, index and assessment in place. But those are some of the considerations that you want to make depending on the context of use as, um, as was alluded. But let's, let's, let's dive deeper into this. Do you think that the tool of MRA is available throughout the US, for example, or throughout other countries? Well, so, th so that's a separate question. That's a question of whether the biomarker is clinically useful. Right. Yes. And so uh, well, yeah. research wise, yes, but clinically, for example, that we already draw back. There are repeated yeah. MRIs, then the expense of the MRI will be the next drawback. And then the third part may be that indeed um, um, it is less quantifiable. I don't know. But if you look at if you look at NAFLD, what they've done is they've shifted from liver biopsy to imaging as a gold standard in clinical trials, and then began to look at serum genetic microbial markers with MRI as a reference standard because it's responsive to change. So you wonder if, um, you know, you have to think about the context of use, but, you know, is endoscopy really the right way we should be using gold standards given the inter-segment variability and sort of gene expression profiles and some of these other things? Um, as a gold standard and just variability and scoring. So some of those things need to be taken into consideration within the context of use when trying to discover some of these biomarkers that you can actually translate into clinical practice um, for differentiating therapies, um, especially sort of like as Ashwin mentioned. I think that's a great point because it really highlights that whatever we do in biomarkers today may be just an intermediate point. So an expression signature is really expression signature what is really impractical to, to use is just an intermediate to a more stable biomarker in a stool. I think there's a potential role for AI and machine learning here as well, because some of these biomarkers are subjective and we want to minimize any subjectivity in interpretation, right? An MR, histologic activity, all these are very useful parameters, but they're highly dependent on the person reading it, which which as the point came up in low volume centers where there may not be enough expertise or experience in this, there is a lot of potent room for error. And so that's potentially you can, even if you don't have access to an expert radiologist, if there's access to uploading images to some central website, either MR or histologic images, or use some kind of AI tool to give you the biomarker readout. I think there's a lot of uh, potential opportunities there with these things not subjective. Um, so there's a, there's a question in the box about this box chain. Does anybody want to take that? It's in the chat box. Can you? I personally don't understand the question. So I don't. That's what is the box? I'm just waiting for someone to tell me what is block chain. Great idea. Great idea. It drives the value of any startup company by factor 10. <laughs> so, Stefan, for people do, who don't know what box chain is, can we, blockchain, can we just tell I'm, I'm not an expert in blockchain, but blockchain obviously is the Bitcoin idea. And what is behind the Bitcoin idea, what is really sexy, is that you cannot forge data. So um, blockchaining data, which means basically resting them in a network of computer, means that, for example, nobody can forge a Bitcoin and that the Bitcoin also in itself cannot be duplicated. So people think about blockchain solutions, for example, when it comes to um, um, 
um, certificates for vaccination. This makes sure you can access them from anywhere in the world. And in contrast to paper-based certificates, they cannot be forged. And they are, they are basically, uh, they cannot be duplicated. Everything is very valid. But for BioMerca, I am not sure what the blockchain should be exactly there because um, forging a biomarker or a biomarker result is really not the point here. Blockchain has a couple of drawbacks so that worldwide basically amplification and reduplication are extremely energy intensive. And uh, it doesn't make sense in my eyes at least. I, I would love to see more explanation why that technology should make sense here um, other than being a buzzword in a biomarker uh, discussion. So that will be my point why I made that skeptical comment saying, hey, it drives um, the value of any biomarker startup by the factor of 10. Because, no, yeah. <laughs> so an explanation would be it's a way of sharing data with anyone, with no one owning the data, right? So it's a, it's a clever ID which would at least theoretically enable everyone to share data with anyone, with no one having sole ownership of the data. And, and it's time so, so that you know who started and what the sequence is of the data input. So there, there is, there is a, if you think about it in conceptual terms, there is a form of blockchain available for IBD data with Yoda and Vivli, where the phase three trial data has been authenticated, uploaded, and kept on a secure server and people have access to it with certain permissions and they can't go in and rewrite or change the original source data. So, you know, you wonder if those public data sharing platforms, which are a form of blockchain, if they uploaded genetic data or microbial data or other biomarker data, whether that could become an opportunity to extend, um, you know, some of these discussions and begin to look at, you know, predictive markers for one drug versus another um, in terms of response and, and whether those data sharing platforms become an avenue to create a blockchain-like opportunity where the source data can't be changed by any user and it's been authenticated by the central users in the sort of system. But has falsification of data been really an issue in the past? I think oh, no, in the past the issues were that there were crap data sets, which were authentic, of course, but they were crap from the start <laughs> and they were incomplete. I think that was a bigger issue than really the uh, mechanism of sharing. I agree, you know, that obviously is a, a good way to use blockchain, but has it been an issue in the, in the past in the US? It hasn't, but I'm just sort of extending, I think, the concept here um, sure. in terms of how, it, how that conceptually could apply, you know, in, in IBD space specifically. Um, but, you know, you could think about um, whether that then extends to other practice validation cohorts. And to Brian's point, you know, a lot of these studies that do omics and then have a requirement to share the data publicly really upload a minimum amount of data. Um, and so, you know, you could create a system where there's a requirement for certain data to be included in order for it to be part of it. So it's not necessarily that there's a question of authenticity, but really just how does the blockchain concept fit you know, when we're thinking about IBD and sort of bringing together those two concepts. Well, I think another piece is that blockchain can also in incentivize patient sharing of data, right? Because, you know, the patient would then own that data, if you will, and, and they, they could basically be compensated for sharing that data. That's one of the ideas I heard. Likewise, I, I mean, I, if, if indeed we go for an approach like this, we have to make sure it's authentic data, right? And I think that's what blockchain also allows us to do and to also understand that data is not a duplicate from another, you know, patient or what have you. Uh, Vijay, you know, there are two questions within the Q&A box. Really? And so if you click down on Q&A on the right panel, you can see the okay. two questions. All right. Thank you. But before that, so let me just close up this part before we get to the next question is that, so um, the one thing I wanted to say is, um, so I think in this positive and negative predictive value, I think we should summarize this thing that from what I've heard from the clinician, that they want a, a biomarker that predicts treatment success. And from a drug developer, from Fred's standpoint, you know, it's actually um, uh, a, something that uh, um, a negative predictive value when you're adding a new drug or new early design, it has got value. So 
So I think we should stop there. And then I can't see the questions. So hold on. So we have a question. Do you think a multi biomarker algorithm that, uh, where did it go? Do you think a multi biomarker algorithm predict therapy response needs to be interpretable? Did we discard these genes that do not have a clear functional? Um, Brian, do you want to take that or who wants to take that? Yeah, I, I can start the discussion. Um, you know, it gets back to the point that sort of Stefan made in, in comment to something I said earlier. I don't know that clinicians really need to care if they can interpret, you know, how the algorithm is put together um, in terms of multi biomarker panels, as long as they know that it's valid for the sort of purposes that it's being used for. Um, so I, I think, you know, but and that's that's the black box of AI. Um, if we're going to get into AI is that we don't actually know how some of these things are put together within the machine learning algorithms that are created. But does it really matter if it validates well across different populations? And I don't know that clinically it really matters um, because I think, you know, providers really just want an answer. Um, and as long as they know that it's valid and it's been validated across different cohorts, and I think that's really all we they they would want. Yeah. And I, th I think that, the, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I guess I would agree. I would agree with that definitely. And I think you know whether it's a black box or something that makes sense mechanistically. Mechanistically, something is is always more satisfying. Although I think you can potentially delude yourself into thinking that it makes sense. You know, to fit fit your mechanism is is a kind of a caveat to that. But yeah, I think performance is going to be critical um, for anything. So if it if it reproduces and across multiple studies, I think that is the the highest priority. Yeah. I was going to say that in cancer, we have CA199 and a whole bunch of biomarkers whose functions we totally don't know, but we use them because they actually are valid and they work really well. Um, I think I would take the next one is about the, in your cohorts, how many, um, you know, minorities are there? Is there some, you know, do they really represent IBD population? Um, when you've run a very big cohort, do you want to take that first? I mean, I think that is an excellent point. I think we're talking about biomarker discovery and validation primarily in the white population, which is where there's been most data. And we know for a lot of factors, microbiome genetics, there's big racial and ethnic diversity. And absolutely, I think it's important part of any any tool to to sort of pick up different diverse populations. I think there's very real data in addition to what's posted in the Q&A that you know, the genes driving IBD are different between East Asian and, and the white population, for example. So some of those genes like the, the TNF family that may actually also predict therapy response and be, be a biomarker from that, from that standpoint may not directly be translatable one to another. For example, NOT2, right? We know that NOT2 is a biomarker for structuring allele disease, but we know NOT2 is also not Crohn's linked in, in much of the South Asian and East Asian population. So that's a perfect example of, of a biomarker not necessarily translating across different diverse populations. I think it is important that we always, you know, always add that caveat whenever we present a study is that we talk about the diversity of the population and that it's primarily applicable to the white population. But don't you think there is a lot of good now new data sets in Asia now that are coming up, similar studies, right? But that should help fill the gap. Because at the end, the population that's around, that's the one that's going to make your, you know, that you're going to only recruit the patients you're seeing at some level. Right. But I mean, but the biomarkers, the way they inform therapies, they inform sort of novel drug discovery, all that for that to be equitable. I think it's important for for diversity to be represented. Obviously, you have to apply it to the patient you're seeing and recruit the patients you are seeing. The same center is not going to necessarily be able to recruit the entire diversity, but it's always important, I think, to keep that in the, in the back of your mind and interpreting data. Right. And so, Gerard's next question is around C-reactive protein and, and, you know, what some of the ethnic diversities and how would that really imply? Does anybody want to take that question?
You I, I just, see, see your active protein, right? Yeah. Okay, I think this has been a utility um, in Europe for a long time, uh, is used to a large extent as an objective verification for disease activity to select patients. I still remember when we did the um, Cellulosum of the Gold studies, and Bill Sandborn was predicting to the company that C reactive protein would be never used by US gastroenterologists because of them it would be an effort they would not be able to take. Now they didn't use it and they failed in their phase three program to a large extent. So now everybody uses it to classify inflammation. So um, I think it's a biomarker with a low utility um, on the therapeutic decision level, but a high utility when it comes to classifying disease types. So it's a classical, um, you would say today, laboratory parameter. But in truth, it is a biomarker, but it would, would not fulfill our requirements of those biomarkers we are eyeing at with the discussion we have. We, the biomarkers we are eyeing at go much deeper because we expect a much higher predictive value and we much uh, expect a much higher relationship to therapeutic outcome, which we both all know CRP does not have. It's more a selection tool, as I feel, for uh, selecting patients for trials and for looking at pathology in general. So individual predictability probably is low. No, I think you're right. We are, I don't think anybody makes those decisions just based on CRP alone. And it's also not specific, right, uh, for IBD. It's a, it's a, I mean, anybody that has inflammation, it could be a COVID-19 or CRP would be high. Yeah. But you need it. You need it. Without a CRP, I feel very strongly, you cannot treat IBD. It's part of your essential laboratory catalog. Yeah. It's not a good biomarker. Yeah, but you, I think the question was more asked in the background as a follow-up question to the diversity question, right? The, the fact that in certain uh, ethnic backgrounds, the mutations in the gene, in the CRP genes, are more prevalent as, as a follow-up to the importance of having diverse cohorts which take that into account, which I think is the same point we, we just discussed in the previous conversation, which I think we all yeah. agree with. We, we right. I, I don't know, did we answer the first question, VJ, which was prognostic versus predictive. Um, uh, we could take it again if you think it's not been answered, but let's do it. Well, just maybe one, one more remark yeah. there. I, I think the illusion that uh, we will easily find predictive biomarkers, I think is an illusion. Most of the biomarkers we will have are prognostic and will be valid across more one MOA, more than one MOA, and that's okay because I think they they are then valid to inform on whether the treatment works or not, and 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 therefore are useful tools. Um, I think it is exceedingly difficult to find predictive biomarkers. That that's my bias, having worked in this domain for a while, irrespective of which omics dimension you use. Yeah, but I think the clinicians are thinking that the predictive has got more value than than the you know because that's what they have for me. Let me finish. Yeah, no. So I was just gonna I was gonna comment on that. I think I'm I'm maybe um, a little bit more naive and optimistic, um, but um, you know I I feel like the opportunity for integration of prognostic and predictive biomarkers is, is actually there. I mean, prognostic biomarkers are you know prognostic of the disease trajectory. That could now be sort of, you know, before treatment intervention to then decide who should get a treatment, or it could be despite treatment intervention, who is still at risk for a complication. And then the sort of whether that transfers then over into being predictive becomes a potentially additive component. So you could see opportunities in the future where you identify a biomarker that's prognostic of a disease complication. Um, and then you use that almost as an enrichment tool um, to understand, um, you know, whether certain therapies are more, whether you can identify predictive biomarkers for which therapy will drive down that risk. Yeah, most. so we, um, we are fully aligned, which is, I'm, I'm just saying that, so we're fully aligned on the use and the utility. So we, we I, I wasn't disputing that, I was just being pessimistic as to our collective ability to find predictive biomarkers. And I hope you prove me wrong because that would be great <laughs> after, you know, only 15 years in the domain 
I'm looking forward to younger researchers making much better strides than I did. So, so I fully agree on your to... point, right? This is very useful. No question about that. I just, yeah. you know, most of those biomarkers actually measure disease trajectory, and therefore, by definition, the mechanisms of actions are trying to impede the, the further the worsening, right? They try to improve your disease and therefore they almost invariably fall back into the prognostic uh, domain rather than the predictive domain. It is yeah. also exceedingly challenging to prove that your that your biomarker is truly predictive because that would mean you tested it across several MOAs, right? So and that's an inherent challenge. Yeah. yeah. So, let me, let's, uh, let's just can... actually ask Bing now. I know last time I think I asked you, you were you had some audio issues. Now, what, from a patient perspective, when you're hearing this predictive values and what what is what are some of your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would I would add to Fred's comments from a patient perspective that a lot of decisions are made between colonoscopies and and a lot happens. Um, but there, there's often a sense of lost time where where I may not be acutely ill, but I'm not well either. And uh, the perfect biomarker in, in my mind from that perspective is in fact a panel that can speak, that reflects the complexity of disease and can generate um, timely responses um, so that I, I get well sooner. Um, so I think the earlier comment about efficiency is critical in, in my mind. I. I, I am optimistic, and I, I was reminded of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's, if, is the glass half full or half empty? And, and the engineer's answer is that the glass is twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> I think it's um, it, it's an exciting time from my perspective, and I'm uh, uh, hopeful that those efficiencies are on the horizon. So, I mean, if I can ask... <laughs> Or not, uh, if I can comment on what Fred said, like, to what degree do you think therapy response is biologically hard to predict versus what, to what degree is it the limitations of the data sets that exist, right? Prognostic data sets can be put together very easily because they're not time dependent variables. You can easily take 2000 patients and if they've been followed up for 10 years. You have that many data points, whereas for therapy response, you need the data sets to be prospective. And so, you know, I think one of the reasons the predictive biomarkers have not come to fruition is just that these data sets are hard to put together, not that they're necessarily biologically harder. I mean, they may be, but I think in large part, these are practical challenges and not necessarily biology. Yeah, but that's, that's, not, that's, one, that's, one, that's one part. The other part is a biological reason. And I think indeed that is not possible with our uh, present concepts, we come back to the ex ante and as post concept to really create biomarkers before a therapy that um, are separating your patients out into different groups. I think the impact of a targeted therapy, which is so precise that it takes a single factor out, unravels and changes pathophysiology. And the remainder of that pathophysiology under the impact of a therapy unveils than different types of disease. So I think that informative part of a biomarker forming out uh, the impact of a therapeutic aggression, a targeted therapeutic aggression on pathophysiology is something that needs to be teased out. And an early time point is important, maybe after one or two weeks into therapy. And that has really not been engaged because usually people are let go during that time, yeah? So a therapy is started, Maybe there's some biomaterial from the time before, and then the therapy is let go, and then whatever, months later, somebody asks the question. So I think this is uh, really important here. So Stefan, maybe you could take a minute and explain what you're doing in 3PR to overcome that hurdle and what yes. your design is. I think yeah. Conceptually, it is take the systems biology approach into uh, human disease. You know, systems biology for a lay person explained as something very simplistic. You come, whatever, to an orchestra. You do not know what an orchestra is because you come from, say, Mars, yeah? And in order to understand what the orchestra is, you clap in your hands and everybody will stop using the instruments. 
And then somebody will start again with the violins and somebody starts again with the trumpets and suddenly you deconvoluted the whole thing, you know, you reset basically. Now, nothing else is done when you have a complex part of physiology that may have run for years and you start to cut into this with a therapeutic principle that just annihilates and inhibits one single factor. And you have the whole part of physiology collapse and may eventually even restart. And the observation of that deconvolutes a complex signal. So um, the concept behind such a biomarker approach is say, we take an expensive new therapy and we block say, alpha 4 beta 7 integrin or IL-23 to say, give you know, promising therapeutics in IBD. And during that impact, we see how the therapy, how the pathophysiology vanishes and starts crumbling. We use the extent of the crumbling as our biomarker. Um, so that has a particular challenge. It means that the patient has been introduced to new therapy. And while he's introduced, we have to ask him back at an early time point to get biomaterials, preferably on the mucosal level in IBD or on the organ level if you use other diseases. That is a, uh, an operational challenge and requires, I think, a, in a quite substantial effort. But probably this is more promising than to go to the beginning before the therapy is introduced and try to find our biomarker in that if we're in that uh, you know, complex interaction of pathophysiologies, we really do not know what has modified what. Okay, so thank you. So I think longitudinal collections are sort of critical and also in this discussion with S20. So I know we're cognizant of time. I just want to switch the topics completely. So we talked about gene expression in the tissue and, uh, and we talked about positive predictive value and negative predictive value, how it impacts from a patient perspective to a clinician perspective to a drug developer perspective. Now let's go into microbiome. That was another aspect that we want to talk about. So I know Ashwin, you presented in your video that there was an inception, pediatric inception cohort where microbial dysbiosis, the breakdown of or sort of thinning of the microbiome community was representative of sort of disease uh, uh, severity. Now, do you think, I would like you to kind of comment on a couple of things. One is what is really the state of affairs of microbiome biomarker and what are some of the promises and some of the pitfalls? Specifically, I want to know, does microbiome correlate with inflammation like a Mayo score or, uh, or SESCD type score? I mean, it does. I think there's data from HMP2, there's data from PROTECT, there's data from, from other courts that have shown there is a correlation between endoscopic severity and microbial composition, and that some of this relationship is actually very linear and, and dose dependent. For example, from the PROTECT study, they showed that there was a clear correlation between like the oral microbiome found in stool and increasing severity of inflammation, like Villanella was much higher in those with like severe compared to mild compared to remission. So it is, it's certainly that relationship exists in the HMP2. They showed that, you know, your dysbiosis blooms correlate with reduced fecal butyrate and increased fecal caprotectin. So they all sort of go well together. And so from a pro standpoint, clearly it's mechanistically important. And so I think that's what makes the microbiome a very attractive, predictive biomarker, because I think it is driving some or a good part of the inflammation. But it is a hard thing to bring into clinic because of the heterogeneity and the influence of various environmental factors, your diet, your microbiome in stool is different from the microbiome on, on biopsies. It's different geographically. And so all those are, I think, challenge. It's also challenging to have quick turnaround, right? You ideally want your biomarker to be resulted when you're asking for it so that you can start somebody on treatment. You can't wait for 60 samples to be batched up and run. And that's where there's some nice data from some groups in MIT, for example, looking at like paper-based diagnostics. Once you have a clear, you know, set of microbial targets, you could potentially have quick, quick turnaround, but that's all, you know, not quite there yet, but I don't think it's uh, entirely a pipe dream. So I think, look, Ashwin- I, 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 I would like to add one more thought so to this, to Ashwin, and that is that microbiome also holds a promise that it is a biological material that can be easily transported, which is not volatile. Maybe even at some point it can be even dried down and shipped by mail. 
um, so uh, or, or conserved in a very simple way. So a microbiome can be sent by a patient from home to a laboratory. It doesn't require a visit to the doctor. It doesn't require any procedure to be taken out. It falls out of you. So that is the attractiveness of microbiome on the operational side. So I think we're going back to Bing's point, right? You know, my, my de decisions about my treatment were made in between my colonoscopies, right? So I'm just going back to that words. Make any comments over here from you is like, do you think this should be more, there should be much more focus on things like this where you could just mail um, uh, from the house and then kind of get a sense of where the state of affairs of the diseases? Yeah, absolutely. All of this sounds great to me as a patient, I, I guess, and I don't think this is semantics, but, um, you know, I think the absence of disease is, is different from uh, my wellness and sometimes bio biomarkers don't um, capture the, the patient's current situation. So I guess to me, in the context of these big data conversations, that begs the question, is as is, is difficult as it is, uh, are we capturing in a standardized way patient reporting so that the, the biomarker um, is tied to the patient's status as well as, uh, you know, more biologic endpoints um, uh, for utility? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I think um, something we are constantly working with is is how do we tie whatever endpoint or outcome we're looking at to to what really matters and is it long-term disease-free complications or steroid use is it how do we figure out the best you know patient reported outcomes to tie into that and i think this is all going to be a constant challenge to try to tie those things together because if you don't have those outcomes firmly firmly kind of grounded then what are you tying your biomarker to and you can be kind of chasing something that's kind of fuzzy in itself so um to to look at histopathology or endo endoscopic scores or other imaging things these all things are things I, I think the field is constantly trying to improve upon so that we then can find more you know these are challenging biomarkers to fit fine from kind of the invasiveness point of view until you can make those sure those are really secure and, and grounded, then how do you do the non-invasive biomarkers so that we can find easier solutions? So it's kind of a almost a things that can happen in parallel, but it's almost a two-step process in some respects. I think Brian, you make an excellent point about two um, uh, different uh, utilities here, or two different requirements. One is how to calibrate the biomarker. Obviously, calibration against endoscopy calibration even against patient reported outcomes or whatever doesn't work in IBD because the index is so shitty, so fuzzy, yeah, so little differentiating that our outcome in IBD can be only judged as white, gray, and black. We do not really have a dynamic range here. There's a reason why biomarkers, for example, are never developed in IBD because they cannot compare. Well, biosimilars are never developed in IBD because they cannot compare biosimilar against an originator in a decent way. So our problem is outcome on the short run is not good to calibrate a biomarker. So our first hurdle is that we know the final outcome, yeah, disease control, no uh, damages due to the disease, these kind of things, yeah, a better trajectory. That can be measured. And so we have to take a long road in terms of the initial calibration. And then you brought us back with the PROs to something which is equally important. No biomarker will survive it doesn't have a relationship to PROs. While they cannot be used to calibrate things, still the relationship is important because only a happy and uh, um, satisfied patient will accept the biomarker um, steering his therapy. So I'm looking to my organizers uh, about time. I would like everybody to give a parting shot on after the discussion, ideally. I know, was it 11.20 KDR time? Could you, can anybody tell me how we went? That's correct, VJ. So it's time to kind of wrap it up at this point. So I think what we do is, uh, why don't we do some parting shots from the each of the panelists, just a quick one, you know, just one or two top things and we can then see what what are some of the top things we need to do. Fred, do you want to go first? Uh, 
I'm sorry, I got distracted, BJ. Can you say that again? No. Is there any parting uh, shots before we wrap up the session? We're wrapping up and then seeing, you know, what we got anything. Sure, sure. Interest? Yeah. No, I, so I, I really like the conversation. I, I think we exchanged a lot of information. Um, I, I think those type of conversations, actually, we need more of them because um, I'm, I'm not optimistic that in isolation, any one of us can solve the problem and finding a way to make the data available and, and exchange ideas and, and forays into this complicated problem can only be beneficial down the road to patients. So I, I would advocate for uh, a mechanism of broader exchange, pre-competitive exchange, a little bit like we're doing in 3TR. Uh, I think that's the future and, and will speed our efforts up. Thank you. Um, Fernley, do you want to go next? Yeah, I think um, I completely agree with what Fred said, and I think you know um, if if we can work towards bringing together um, you know routine practice opportunities to collect some of these biospecimens in well-defined cohorts, the discarded serum, the discarded stool, um, you know leftover tissue from biopsies taken in colonoscopies. We might have a, an actual way to build something um, together that can be used as a resource going forward. Um, and I think it's going to be important over time to begin to think about imaging um, and, and whether we can find intermediate biomarkers that serve as a better um, you know, opportunity or reference standard, like Stefan said, that have a better you know, scale that can be measured against when looking for future biomarker discovery. Brian, do you want to go next? I think we've brought up um, all great questions about not only data sharing, um, but also the applicability of these different biomarkers and kind of what their what their purpose is. As, as I said before, I think there's different purposes and, and um, it's really critical to understand kind of what you're looking for in a biomarker. You know, what is the, the context of use as it were? So, um, yeah, I think the conversation continues from these different kind of perspectives of clinical trials all the way down to patient care and patient perspectives are are, are great to have. Um, Bing? Yeah, I, I'd just like to start by saying thank you for um, including a patient voice in this discussion. I'm, I'm grateful for all the work that's happening. Um, as a parting shot, when I, when I try to organize different pieces of exciting information. I, I often find myself thinking about wellness instead of disease and thinking about what that means biologically or physiologically as opposed to what, what that means, um, you know, outside on a Saturday afternoon. And I, I hope that these kinds of conversations continue to sort of challenge the way we think about disease activity and remission and um, treating patients. Thank you, Bing. It's an honor for you to have have you on the panel. Really appreciate it, uh, Ashwin. No, I think bio. I mean, I would echo everything that's been said. But biomarker discovery, I think, more than anything else, has to be in science. There has to be collaboration across different academic institutions, between academia and industry, between industry with different MOAs, and not within within one particular therapeutic target. And and once you have and between scientists and clinicians and clinicians and patients, so I think it has to be you have to have stakeholders from all those representatives, much like there is on the panel, to to advance the field forward. Otherwise, you'll have a number of sort of modestly relevant biomarkers that are not going to change anything. Thank you, Stefan. I, I think I like to add, uh, said already a lot, but I'd just like to add that uh, it's very clear that with all the hindrances we have in IBD, which are bigger than other diseases, our cohorts must be big and well interlinked. So we don't get there with a 200 patient cohort, unfortunately. And it requires probably a successful approach, would require a large collaborative effort across companies, across probably even regulators, across academic centers for sure. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Gerard has just pinged another question, and I know I'm just going to just read it aloud. All therapies should have sample and data sets available for prediction for market discovery. 
from uh, pr prospective trials there. The economics of stratifying patient subsets may run counter to commercial expectations. Thoughts on how should we do that? How should we should address the gaps? I think it's a big question. I don't know if we have the time, but I do think that this could be something that we could take as a take home message. I think most most drug trials, I mean, at my party shop is everybody's trying to do the right thing, but every time that we finish this, these studies take forever, they take really long, and technologies change, methodologies change, samples, collections change. And then people that have come up with some really decent biomarkers that are not easily applicable in the clinic because there's cost, nobody pays for it. How do we, how do we solve that problem, right? So there are many other problems. So I think it, unless somebody has any burning question or comments on this, uh, we could wrap this session.